Written by Christopher Rocchio, Empire of Silence is the opening book in the Sun Eater series, the first of what will ultimately be seven books, with Disquiet Gods, the sixth book, having recently been published. There are also a bunch of novellas and short stories to flesh out the universe even more. Empire of Silence, the first book, was published back in 2018 or 19, so I'm five or six years late to this party. Can there really be anyone else out there that hasn't read this yet? On the other hand, I surely can't be the only person who totally missed this series. It flew under my radar entirely, so maybe it flew under yours too. So if you're also new to this series and if you're curious to know more, and if like me you're partial to an epic and well-written space opera, then here are 10 reasons why you should read Empire of Silence. Reason number one, you can play Spot the Influence. Empire of Silence is a book which wears its influences on its sleeve, loud and proud. Christopher Rocchio has said this is entirely deliberate. There's a liberal sprinkling of Easter egg references and some obvious sources. Our protagonist is Hadrian Marlowe, who is a young man when we first meet him, the oldest son of a planetary ruling house. Paul Atreides, anyone? The Solon Empire is a galaxy-spanning empire of tens of thousands of worlds, and there are even more non-aligned worlds, all colonised by humans over the last 20,000 years. The Imperium, do we think? Hadrian has a swordmaster, a tutor who knows everything, a personal shield that protects against projectile weapons but not swords, a giant throne room built deliberately to intimidate, a long-standing taboo regarding computers and artificial intelligence, again, Dune. There are laser or high matter swords, giant wedge-shaped starships, Star Wars. There are many, many more, but don't let this put you off. I say it's a good thing. Rocchio takes these familiar, well-loved elements and adds a chunky amount of his own ideas, definitely weaving them all into something new, something that I think stands firmly on its own feet, acknowledging what's come before, but not aping it. This is no paint-by-numbers imitation. Rocchio is also a student of history, so there are elements of Roman and Greek civilization here, with a touch of Japanese and Imperial Britain too. It's fascinating stuff. Reason number two, epic scope. Empire of Silence introduces us to a sprawling galactic empire spanning thousands of planets and star systems and civilizations. And there's a limit to what one book can cover, so we really just get an introduction here. We do get Vivid descriptions of a couple of worlds, each with its own culture, history and technology, which hint at the broader Sun Eater universe. Empire of Silence, as I've said, is the first of what will now be seven books, which in itself implies epic. The distances involved in travelling around the Empire, even at many times the speed of light, are such that decades can pass in real time whilst the travellers sleep. Empire of Silence is replete with political intrigue, power struggles and Machiavellian schemes of petty but powerful imperial bureaucrats and priests. We're drawn into a web of alliances, betrayals and shifting allegiances reminiscent of the epic struggles depicted in historical dramas. Rocchio explores profound themes of destiny, morality and the nature of existence, drawing upon cosmic myths and archetypes. All of that, I think, combines to give Empire of Silence a truly epic feel. Reason number three, menacing alien aliens. The Sielsin are the primary alien threat in Empire of Silence, posing a formidable challenge to the human-dominated Solon Empire. Little is known about their origins or motivations, adding to their enigmatic and menacing presence in the story. They are implacable and relentless, and are burning worlds on the edge of the Empire. Parents invoke the Sielsin to scare their children, but few in the Empire have encountered the enigmatic aliens and no one understands what they want and why they're bent on destroying. What is clear is that the Sielsin are a highly advanced, and technologically superior species, possessing formidable weaponry and seemingly limitless resources. The Sielsin are humanoid, but they are inhuman. Tall, white-skinned, horned, they are portrayed as a relentless and expansionist force, driven by a singular purpose that remains shrouded in mystery. Their methods are ruthless and merciless, as they wage war against humanity with brutal efficiency, leaving devastation in their wake. As Empire of Silence unfolds, Hadrian Marlowe gets up close and personal with some Sielsin who crash land on Emesh near the site of some alien relics. Some are captured and tortured by the Chantry priests, with Hadrian intervening, his smattering of Sielsin language proving useful. The threat posed by the Sielsin serves as a catalyst for much of the action and intrigue in Empire and Silence, driving the narrative forward as Hadrian seeks to uncover the truth behind their enigmatic agenda and find a way to open a dialogue to negotiate a peace, teeing up the following novels. Reason number four, an intriguing blend of fantasy and space opera. Sun Eater as a series, at least based on what I've read so far, is unapologetically a space opera. It's broad in scope, gothic in tone, but with all the features you'd expect of a space opera. Spaceships, hypersleep, a galactic empire, aliens, strange civilizations, genetic modification, artificial wombs, rebels, all the sci-fi trimmings. 
Empire of Silence has this, but it also has a good dose of plotline and world building that wouldn't be out of place in an epic fantasy. There's the dynastic nobility, a rigid class system, a religious order with in-house torturers, a fish out of water, riches to rags, tail, swords, sandals, gladiator battles. And there's a lengthy section of the book where Hadrian is stranded on Emesh after being abandoned there by the dishonest crew of the freighter he paid to help him escape from his homeworld. Forced to hide lest he be scanned and identified and returned to his family, he loses everything. After a period as a beggar and a thief, utterly stripped of his airs and graces, Hadrian ends up as a gladiator. And this is where some of Hadrian's most loyal and lasting friendships are forged. And whilst there is still a tinge of science fiction, the, the opposition in the gladiatorial arena are force field shielded, for example, this section of the book feels much more like a sword and sandals fantasy. Reason number five, a clumsy and youthful protagonist prone to melodrama. Hadrian Marlowe is born into a noble family, which grants him access to genetics, longevity, health, wealth, education and social status. Their planet is something of a galactic backwater, but they do have a regional monopoly on uranium production, a dirty but lucrative business which sustains their family's position. Hadrian struggles against the expectations and constraints imposed by his aristocratic upbringing, yearning for freedom and purpose beyond the confines of his privileged existence. Hadrian is 19 when we first meet him, possessing a keen intellect and insatiable curiosity, driving him to seek out knowledge and understanding of the universe. Under the influential tutelage of Tor Gibson, he is well read in literature, philosophy and science, and he constantly questions the status quo, frequently bringing him into conflict with his austere father. Hadrian grapples with moral ambiguity and ethical dilemmas throughout Empire of Silence, wrestling with questions of right and wrong, the demands of duty and his personal moral code. He's neither purely virtuous nor irredeemably flawed, but rather a nuanced and multi-dimensional character whose actions are shaped by his experiences and convictions. He's prone to melodrama and impulsive acts and knows it. His MO is to act first and think later. Sometimes this pays off handsomely and sometimes it just kicks him in the arse. I was often left thinking, no, Hadrian, what the hell are you doing? So, in Empire of Silence, Hadrian experiences triumphs and tragedies, victories and losses, beginning to shape him into a tragic hero destined for greatness and suffering that's foretold at the start of the book. He confronts his own demons and inner conflicts, striving to reconcile his idealism with the harsh realities of the world around him. He is neither hero or villain, just a guy trying and sometimes failing to do the right thing. Reason number six, detailed, lush world building. Empire of Silence is a remarkable feat of world building. It's immersive, it's richly detailed and intricately crafted. Christopher Rocchio has constructed a galaxy teeming with diverse cultures, civilizations and technologies. And at the heart of the novel's world building is the sprawling galactic empire, the Solon Empire. A complex web of interstellar domains governed by noble houses, powerful corporations and enigmatic institutions. Rocchio meticulously explores the political, social and economic dynamics of his empire, depicting a society marked by hierarchy, intrigue and ambition. We get glimpses of jumbled history from back in the early days of space travel to the current date, some intriguing background to the dogma of the Chantry, the priestly outfit that helps to prop up the empire. The Chantry seemed to be loosely based on the Inquisition era Catholic Church. They manage the cult of Earth and they are implacably opposed to human augmentation and any kind of artificial intelligence whilst just as vigorously promoting humanity's supremacy and divine right to rule the galaxy over all others. There are mentions of the Americani, surely the Americans, who drove the initial expansion into space but were later overcome by the AI that they unleashed and defeated by the Empire. Beyond the confines of the Solon Empire, in Empire of Silence, Rocchio introduces us to a multitude of non-aligned planets and civilizations, some of which feature more significantly in the following novels. The world building in Empire of Silence is distinguished by its attention to detail and immersive storytelling. Rocchio paints a vivid picture of the galaxy through evocative descriptions, vibrant characters and meticulously researched historical and cultural references. Whether exploring the opulent palaces of the Solon nobility or the desolate landscapes of distant planets, you can expect to be transported to a world brimming with wonder, with danger and with adventure. It's a triumph of imagination and craftsmanship, a book to lose yourself in. Reason number seven, structure. The structure of Empire of Silence is a standout feature of the novel. Uh, Christopher Rocchio employs a framing device where the protagonist, Hadrian Marlowe, narrates his life story from a future vantage point. And this narrative approach imbues Empire of Silence with a sense of intimacy and immediacy as we're invited into Hadrian's innermost thoughts and reflections on his journey through life. Right from the first page or two, we know how the story ends. And I'll read you some lines. The light of that murdered sun still burns me. I see it through my eyelids, blazing out of history from that bloody day, hinting at fires indescribable. 
I make no excuses, no denials, no apologies for what I've done. I know who I am. The Scoliasts might start at the beginning with our remote ancestors clawing their way out of old Earth's system in their leaking vessels. But no, to do so would take more volumes and ink than my hosts have left at my disposal. And even I, who has more time than any other, have not time for that. Should I chronicle the war then? Start with the alien Cielsin howling out of space in ships like castles of ice? You can find war stories, read the death counts, the statistics. No context can make you understand the cost. Cities raised, planets burned, countless billions of our people ripped from their worlds to serve as meat or as slaves for those pale monsters. Families old as empires ended in light and fire. The empire has its official version, one that ends in my execution with Hadrian Marlow hanged for all to see. I do not doubt that this tome will do aught but collect dust in the archive where I have left it, one manuscript amongst billions at cultures. Forgotten, and perhaps that's best. The worlds have had enough of tyrants, enough of murderers and enough of genocides. But perhaps you will read on, tempted by the thought of reading the work of so great a monster as the one made in my image. You will not let me be forgotten, because you want to know what it was like to stand aboard that impossible ship and rip the heart out of a star. You want to feel the heat of two civilizations burning and to meet the dragon, the devil that wears the name my father gave me. So, let us bypass history, sidestep the politics and the marching tramp of empires, forget the beginnings of mankind in the fire and ash of old earth, and so too ignore the Cielsin riding in cold and from darkness. These tales are recorded elsewhere, in all the tongues of mankind and their subjects. Let us move to the only beginning that I have a right to, my own. By framing the story as a memoir or a chronicle, Rocchio creates a compelling sense of authenticity and depth as Hadrian recounts his experiences with honesty and introspection. This allows us to witness Hadrian's growth and development over time, from his formative years as a young nobleman grappling with the many questions of identity and purpose, to his later exploits as a seasoned warrior and statesman, ultimately to notoriety. The chronicle structure lends a sense of inevitability to the tale. We're aware from the outset that Hadrian is recounting events that have already transpired, adding a layer of tension and anticipation patient to the story. In fact, Rocchio uses this frequently, yes in the big overarching plot point, the series is called Sun Eater for a reason, but also in the smaller detail. In the telling of his story, Hadrian often drops a minor bombshell, a foreshadowing, a delayed fuse bomb if you like. You know that something significant is going to happen, but not how, and I lapped it up, burning through the pages to find out. Hadrian's recollections are tinged with nostalgia and regret as he grapples with the consequences of his choices and the weight of his own mortality. This imbues Empire of Silence with a sense of poignancy and depth, and we're drawn into Hadrian's innermost struggles and triumphs. Perhaps the only downside of this structure is that past Hadrian is imbued with plot armour. We know that nothing too bad can happen to him, because he's telling us the story at the end. Overall, the memoir or chronicle-like structure of Empire of Silence is a clever narrative device, and I think it enhances the richness and the complexity of the novel. Reason number eight, strong character and relationship work. Bumbling idiot, though, Hadrian sometimes is, he manages to forge some strong friendships in Empire of Silence, many of which are carried forward into the next books. Many of these begin while he's stranded on Emesh. Whilst eking out an existence as a petty thief, Hadrian makes friends with a street urchin, Cat, with whom Hadrian has many misadventures. Their friendship is tender and well-drawn despite the chaos of street life. And in the spirit of avoiding spoilers, Hadrian is forced to move on and ends up as a gladiator in the local games, an imperial spectacle for the control of the masses. Among the fellow gladiators are Polino, Gen and Switch. Switch is a former prostitute used and abused by the crew of a ship for a long time and when he meets Hadrian he's timid and lacking in confidence but by the end of the book he's a seasoned gladiator and goes on to be a close friend and confidant of Hadrian. And we're also introduced to Dr Valka Edda as an ologist from the Demarchy of Tavros which is outside the writ of the Empire. She's often referred to as that Tavrosi witch because of the technology implants that she has. Very much taboo in the Empire, but tolerated as she is considered to be a diplomatic envoy from Tavros. I really like the interplay between Hadrian and Valka. He's smitten from day one and she's dismissive of Hadrian as just another pampered noble, but they do share an interest in the Cielsin. And their relationship is one of the better ones in Empire of Silence and only gets deeper and more important as the series goes on. We meet other characters in Empire of Silence, bit players really in this book, but with whom Hadrian will develop deep friendships and enmities in later books. And we know this up front because Hadrian tells us that it's so in one of those foreshadowings that I spoke about. Reason number nine, engaging prose style. 
Hadrian is the narrator of the tale, and at heart he's a scholar, and he has seen and experienced more than most over a period of hundreds of years. Rocchio uses the chronicle structure and Hadrian's long, weary experience to give us very rich prose. It's ornate, sometimes dense, and some might say overblown on occasion, but much more often it's beautifully written. And I think this contributed significantly to my enjoyment of the book. Within the first few pages, I knew that I was in good hands from a writing point of view. Reason number 10, the slow build. Empire of Silence is a chunky book by itself, 600 pages in the edition that I have, and there's a lot packed into that page count, and while the story does come to something of a close, it's very clearly teeing up the following books. Empire of Silence is therefore best seen as the beginning, because it is. Rocchio is building a solid foundation for the rest of Hadrian's story, and I think that this might be my only note of caution for this book. Much time is spent building a picture, introducing us to a large cast of characters, many of whom are peripheral, two-dimensional even in this book, but important later on. So if you want a satisfying tale with all loose ends neatly closed off and tied with a ribbon, then Empire of Silence on its own may not be the book for you. Equally, if you're troubled or daunted by the prospect of a seven-volume epic, then it might be a mistake to take the first step. But, but if you are happy to take your time, enjoy the world building, get to know some of the key characters, immerse yourself in the depth and breadth of the universe that Rocchio has created, then I think the Empire of Silence will work for you and that you will want to continue on. Overall, I love this book. It's so good and I heartily recommend it. But the good news is that the next book in the series, Howling Dark, is even better. I think Rocchio's writing gets even stronger. The characters are deeper and better drawn, more three-dimensional. And there are conflicts, deepening friendships, lovers, betrayals, and some of the events are truly jaw-dropping. But that is a subject for another video. Let me know if you're a fan of the Sun Eater series or if you're now tempted to dive in. And as always, thank you for watching. And until next time, goodbye for now.